Thanks. Good. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming to this uh, like a special AFRI departmental seminar. Thank you, Molly and Justin, for making this an AFRI seminar. I'm Dave Shirley, and I'm a uh, co director with uh, My Wish Moradia right now of the food security group in the department. Um, and then I also coordinate uh, PRCI. PRCI is what's called an innovation lab funded by USAID. The innovation lab system is the system that USAID has engaged for engaging with US universities to bring science to bear everywhere from you know, poultry germplasm to crop germplasm to food security policy, right? Science and research to bear on their programmatic decision-making, right? And, and their work in countries. So PRCI is a food security policy innovation lab with a heavy emphasis on institutional capacity strengthening, right? So individual capacity strengthening, but in an institutional context um, in Africa and Asia. Globally, really, currently we're working in, in Africa and Asia. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about the context for this seminar, um, and then Justin will introduce our speakers. So within PRCI, we teamed up at the beginning of the proposal for this with Cornell University and Chris Barrett. I'm sure you all know Chris Barrett. And he started some years ago the STARS program, S-T-A-A-R-S, -A -A okay? For Structural Transformation in African Agricultural Rural Spaces, okay? He came up with a, a good set of words that meant something and then gave a good acronym as well. And that was focused on a competitive selection of individual early career African scholars, right? Who would put in uh, proposals for, for uh, research, okay? Based on already existing data, no, no, no money for new data collection. Individual scholars from across Africa, early career, they had to be no more than five years out from their PhD, okay? And then they were competitively selected and put through an intensive mentoring process. And, and Chris had a set of faculty from uh, Cornell and then a few from Syracuse and maybe Rutgers University that worked as mentors on that. So we saw that program and um, we thought it could be useful within PRCI with a few tweaks, right? So we designed the SARS Plus program, an additional A, it's now triple A for Asia, in Africa, okay? Mm -hmm. And the plus simply means that rather now than individuals, okay, who could be even un institutionally unaffiliated in the STARS program, rather than that, it had to be teams of researchers from research centers um, in Africa and Asia, okay? Um, and then other than that, it's basically the same program, teams of researchers um, with the support of their center leadership, right? would put in proposals and these would be competitively reviewed and selected. So we started this program in our PRCI started in 2019 and the first cohort of STARS plus fellows started that fall. A key feature of the program had always been um, bringing the fellows to Cornell University when it was just Cornell under the STARS program for three weeks of just intensive um, giving of seminars, getting a very intensive feedback, very critical, very dynamic feedback from the whole set of mentors, um, and then working intensively with their mentors to kind of revise, of course, the proposal and the methods that they've been developing um, on the way to producing a paper with the objective always being, I guess this is the other part of the plus um, within the STARS plus program, the objective always being under both programs to get a paper submitted for peer review, right? Hopefully approved and then and, and eventually peer review published, right? Um, and then under STARS Plus, we emphasize also the policy outreach component of this. So with their centers, they're feeding these results into the policy outreach that the that, that, that their center normally does. And this is a special topic for it. Um, so obviously a few world conditions intervened and there was no um there were no visits to the us um in 2019 2020 or 2021 so we're now just starting up the fourth cohort of stars plus uh, fellows the fourth cohort just barely started so this september we brought three three of the, the first three cohorts they started at cornell they just came back from two weeks i believe at cornell 
and now they're coming through um, through MSU for the two teams that have MSU mentors, right? That's the team from Pilaf at the University of Ibadan uh, in Nigeria. They're, they're the ones, and, and Justin will introduce them. They're going to be speaking today. And then Wednesday, there's a team from EPRC, the Economic Policy Research Center um, in Uganda. Um, they're mentored by Duncan Bowden and uh, Rui Benfica, who is now with IFBRI, has a few MSU connections as well, but he's teaming up with Duncan Bowden to mentor that team. Um, here is Justin uh, um, George from MSU, working with Mart Martino and Charlie uh, from, from Cornell. So that's the background. Um, I'll turn it to Justin to introduce the team, and then we'll then go. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we have the team from the lab, Nathaniel G. Olipepe and uh, Benjamin Olisegunoilami. And we also have like Iradel Ogunbeo, but he couldn't be here because of visa issues visa and issues. stuff. Yeah. So um, today they will be presenting uh, on the topic resilience to COVID-19 and security shocks, uh, evidence from Nigeria. Uh, just a brief introduction. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant negative impacts on uh, household welfare outcomes in most developing countries. And some of those places were actually already exposed to shocks, including, let's say, armed conflicts or natural disasters or droughts and things related to that. So uh, their research objective is to um, actually analyze whether um, a specific type of shocks, in this case, armed conflicts, whether households which are, which are previously exposed to uh, armed conflicts, in this case, respond differently in terms of their resilience capacities to the uh, new <coughs> shock or the COVID-19 shock. So I had a wonderful time um, working with them remotely and first time in, in person. And as um, Dave has already mentioned, this is a, a feedback uh, workshop observation. So feel free to be, um, you know, to ask any questions or suggestions later there, because uh, this is only the first draft and it will be improved uh, further. So I welcome uh, both Nathaniel and Benjamin to uh, do the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Benjamin Oyelami from Pilaf, Nigeria. And uh, together with the uh, other two in my team, Ulutegui Nathaniel Siji and Ogumbayo Uridele Emmanuel, uh, we are quite honored to be uh, mentored by Justin and uh, Martina, as earlier uh, mentioned. And, uh, the topic of our research is resilience to COVID-19 and insecurity shocks evidence from Nigeria. Uh, as a sort of uh, background, I must uh, appreciate the support from PRCI and from all uh, important uh, individuals in the, in the PRCI family, beginning from Dave's and uh, many other ones. So thank you very much. So I'll go straight into our research now. Now, as an introduction, uh, COVID-19, as we all know, started around December uh, far in, uh, in, in China, and uh, it came up as a shock to the, to the global community. And uh, getting to March 11th, it was officially declared as a pandemic of a global scale. And uh, as at August 23rd, 2022, uh, the global figure of the effect of COVID-19 stands at uh, about, over, over, over five, <laughs> 5 million cases and uh, over 6 uh, million deaths. And uh, it went on that way. In Nigeria, the first case was confirmed on the 27th of uh, uh, 
February, that is 2020. And uh, as at August 23rd, this year, 2022, we have had about 2 million 662 uh, million 748 cases and over 3,000 deaths. Now that figure may look a bit low uh, compared to other nations, but it is reflective of the fact that uh, the cases of uh, testing in Nigeria is a bit low, and that is why we can have that figure a bit low to other countries. Now, before COVID-19 came, insecurity has been a challenge in Nigeria, beginning from Boko Haram, which has displayed over 2.3 million people, and it has led to more than 58,000 deaths. Banditry is part of it. Pamaida clashes, militancy, that's in the south-south zone, and also some secessionist agitations in the southeast zone. All of these have been interacting and have been affecting the households situation and particularly food security situation in households in Nigeria. Scholars have described all of this as armed conflict. And uh, as all of that was going, again, we discovered that the COVID-19 shock had it to it. And uh, there have been studies that showed that uh, COVID-19 was seen food insecurity. It was seen the uh, unemployment, it increased inflation and also increased cases of uh, insecurity. Now, the households in Nigeria now appear to be on a two platform. Some that have been facing the insecurity shocks before COVID-19 came and others who probably have a relatively peaceful life before COVID-19. So the growing concern in the mind of uh, researchers is how have households been fearing in terms of their resilience to both the COVID-19 shock as well as the insecurity shock. And um, resilience has been described as the ability of the household to prepare for, to cope with, and adapt to shock in such a way that doesn't make them fall below or far below the poverty, poverty line. So the motivation of this work is actually to uh, look at the combined effect, try to examine the combined effect of COVID-19 and insecurity shocks. And there have been previous works that were reviewed, uh, as we can see on the slide, there have been work on effect of COVID-19 and insecurity on food access, food security, poverty, financial inclusion and coping strategies deployed. There have been also work on households and children's school resilience to COVID-19 shock and all of that. But uh, there's been, there hasn't been much work that actually brought to bear the, the, the resilience of household to the combined effect of COVID-19 and the insecurity shocks. And that is why this study is trying to look into filling that gap. Um, also realize that there's a need to actually ascertain that COVID-19 indeed caused higher food insecurity. Uh, it is much assumed that that is what we be, but uh, there hasn't been much work that is grounded on the causal link. And this work is trying to look into that area. There are also limited research on how COVID-19 affected food insecurity situation, particularly of vulnerable groups, such as those that are insecurity within and uh, those that have so, some other types of vulnerability. And uh, this work is trying to look into that area as well. There are also limited study that worked on COVID-19 going down to the grassroots level as you look at it up to the local government level. Several data on the COVID-19 in Nigeria has been up to the state level. And this work, we want to look further down, look at how it it's actually applies up to the local government level. So 
there is a broad research question that we have before us, and it has to do with giving the resilience capacities of households pre-COVID-19 outbreak. How do how does COVID-19 and harm conflict shocks relate to food security? Now, uh, I will present a point and my colleague will come and continue when it comes up. He will be going into the methodological aspect of how we are looking at that. And there are some specific objectives uh, that we drew out the general objective or broad objective that I've just mentioned which has to do with the first one describing the pre-COVID-19 resilience capacity of households in the armed conflict affected oh, yeah. areas as well as the unaffected areas. Also, we want to ascertain the privilege. Keep okay, thank you. <laughs> so the second objective, as specific objective, has to do with ascertaining prevalence level and the, the containment measures, containment measures of COVID-19 in armed conflict uh, affected areas and as well as the unaffected areas in Nigeria. And the third one has to do with examining the pre and post food security status of the conflict affected areas as well as those non-affected uh, areas. So at this point, I will pause and my colleague will continue. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Benjamin, for that very wonderful presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about the methodological review uh, that we have done. We'll also be presenting our preliminary results and also drawing some conclusions based on the preliminary results that we're going to be presenting to us. Yes, we did quite a lot of literature search on the topic of resilience. Resilience is really an emerging topic. Uh, in our search of the literature, we've been able to ascertain um, three key methods that are used presently to uh, operationalize the war resilience. And the first that we have been able to identify is the one adopted or developed by FAO uh, and is popularly known as the RIMA model, uh, which is talking about, which is tagged resilience indicators for measurement and analysis. That's the RIMA model. Because this model uh, operationalized resilience in four, using four different pillars, and those are access to basic services, assets, social, social safety net, and adaptive capacity. This model conceptualized results, I mean, uh, resilience as a latent period, moderating the effect of shocks and uh, uh, particular outcome of well-being. I mean, uh, uh, the desire, I mean, well-being well outcome of the people. Uh, the model actually used the same model, which is all, which is referred to as the structural equation modeling. Um, we've had different authors that have made use of this model: the Handa and Ocheri, 2022; Derico Romano and Petrelli, 2018. The second uh, approach to resilience measurement in the contemporary literature is also the one by Cici and Barrett. Uh, this was developed in 2018. And of course, the model or the framework is guided by the definition given by Barrett and Contas in 2014, which define resilience in terms of having an acceptably high likelihood of remaining above the poverty line or other meaningful well-being thresholds, even in the face of shocks and stressors. Of course, it also conceptualized resilience as an outcome measure I mean, measure anchored on some normative standard of well being. It's used OLS to be able to estimate also the specific conditional mean of well being, the, the residuals from which can then be estimated, can be used to estimate the also specific conditional variance. And of course, it has also been used in different study concepts. 
just like we have on the slide. Now, the thought that this story is trying to adopt is the one by the Tango, the Tango, uh, the Tango Framework for Resilience Measurements, as proposed by Derrico and uh, Smith, 2019. This model or this framework operationalized resilience just like the RIMA model as uh, as a moderating, I mean, as a latent variable to moderating uh, shocks and specific household well-being outcome. And in the case of both RIMA and the Tango, they use food security as this uh, well-being indicator. And it also conceptualizes resilience using three pillars. That's the transformative capacity, the adoptive capacity, and the absorptive capacity. And it's used factor analysis to come up with an index of, res of resilience that they, cause, that they call resilience capacity index, and also use regression to explain realized resilience. But in the case of this work, we are not going to make use of realized resilience as an indicator of resilience because of some criticism around this approach, which I'm going to talk about later. Now, talking about the pillars of re resilience, we have the absorptive capacity, the adaptive capacity, and the transformative capacity. Adaptive capacity is defined by Tango as the capacity to minimize exposure to shocks and stresses where possible and to recover quickly when exposed. And the adaptive capacity is defined as the capacity to make proactive and informed choices about alternative livelihood strategies based on changing conditions. The third one is the transformative capacity, which is like a system level enabling condition for lasting resilience, which includes uh, governance mechanisms, policies, infrastructure, community networks, and former safety nets that are part of the wider system in which households and communities are embedded. Yes, like I said, there have been criticism to uh, use of realized resilience as used by both the Tango model and the Rima model. And realized resilience is defined as the difference between uh, the full security or well being indicators within two different I mean, two different times. And so the criticism against this approach is the fact that at the baseline period, some households who possibly, uh, I mean, have low level of this well-being, I mean, this who have low level of this well-being indicators have a better advantage to increase their well-being over time as compared to those households who are already high at the baseline uh, period who may not have enough room to be able to expand on their well-being indicator. And so the argument is that it will not be fair to all research subjects to put them, I mean, to use this as a yardstick, given that they are not put, they are not put on the same standard of measurement and opportunity to increase their well-being at the same rate. In this study, we are instead of using realized resilience, we are using food security status, which according to Barrett is much more preferred by policies, policy makers and also based on the uh, criticism that other authors have also advanced concerning this approach. And so instead of, but there's something different that this study is also going to do uh, in our approach to also measuring resilience. And what we are going to do differently is in Tango Mode, Tango Mode came up with just a single index for resilience capacity. But in, in this study, we are coming up with different, I mean, we are coming up with index for each of these pillars. And so we want to see the extent to which each of these pillars influence the well-being outcome of the households that we are trying to study, which in this case is referred to as the full security level of the people. Yes, the data we are making use of is the LSMS ISA data, which is a national representative data. ISA data uh, has about four waves. It started, I think, in about 2010. And the last wave 
concluded so concluded in 2019. So given our objective, because our objective is to look at what the situation was just before COVID. We want to assess the uh, baseline resilience capacity of the people using the last wave of the LSMS ISAB. We are also making use of the um, high frequency longitudinal phone survey. About there are 11 rounds of them that were conducted, that were collected post COVID. And so, but within these 11 rounds, because our variable of interest, our outcome variable of interest, which is full security, are only available in just three rounds. That's round two, round four, and round seven. So we are linking these two data sets and now at household level so that we'll be able to conduct our analysis. And what's the last year of the LSMS ISA survey? 1819. Yeah. 2018, 2019. Okay, 2018, 2019. Exactly. And then it was followed by the high. Exactly. And we are making use of the ACLED data. ACLED data is the Armed Conflict and Event Data Project. It's a very rich and robust data set, open access that contains data on conflict across different countries of the world. Just like the ISC, I mean LSMS ISC data and the high, high frequency longitudinal phone survey, this data set is also geocoded. And so the idea is to link these three data sets using the geocode information uh, to be able to uh, get, I mean, extract all the information uh, that are relevant to the objective of the study on this. We're also making use of uh, we are sourcing data from the N NCDC, that is the Nigeria Center for uh, Disease Control, to collect information on COVID-19 prevalence at local government level. However, for the purpose of this presentation, we have that data set available only at state level, and it's, it has gone into the analysis that we are going to be presenting results about in this presentation. We are also uh, we have also done some desk work, I mean, desk top review to collect um, contain, information on containment measures across the 36 states of Nigeria. That data still requires some further processing. And so the preliminary result that we're going to be presenting today does not have that information, but we hope to integrate it into our subsequent analysis. Who's making the noise? Okay. okay. Uh, well, I mean, I want to bother us with so much information about this. I've said so much about LSMS, ISA data. This is these are just further explanation to that, but many of them are not really relevant to us. And the second is the high frequency longitudinal phone survey. I've said so much about that as well. So everything I've, I mean, we have here is like what I've said before. Of course, I've also said something about this. Now, these are uh, the indicators of resilience capacity as proposed by Tango model. And it's along three pillars that Tango calls absorptive, adaptive, and transformative. So we have these indicators under each of them. And what this study uh, uh, did was to use, collect information on these. Some of them actually are measured at different, um, using different units. But what we did was to do factor analysis. And we came up with an index for each of the resilience pillars. And at the end of the day, we also came up with an index of resilience capacity. But each of them now, percentage, having a score now of, I mean, ranging between one and 100 for each of the pillars and also for the overall resilience uh, capacity. This is the econometric model that we are making use of. Um, like we proposed, 
in our objective, we are looking at the combined effect of COVID-19 on the well-being outcome of households in the study. And so we have this model. Um, the first one there is talking about the combined effect of uh, that C, okay, or C there. Okay, I think P is prevalence, C is conflict. Then this C here is talking about uh, the containment measure, but this is as proposed. That variable is not available in the analysis that we have done. Uh, this is talking about um, adaptive capacity that we have uh, uh, collected information about and now is presented. We have this as transformative capacity. Uh, it's also included in the model that are going to be pre presenting result about much later, much later. This absorptive capacity, that is the third leg of the uh, resilience capacity in the model. And of course, we're also including some socioeconomic variables uh, into our model. All of this will be presented in our results. And those capacities are all estimated from the LSMS ISAs exactly. that are prior to exactly. the exactly. COVID shock. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, one beauty of data blend this story is going to achieve is, which perhaps has not happened until, has not happened before now, is the blend of LSMS ISA data with the ACLE data with COVID-19 phone survey, COVID-19 prevalence, as well as containment measures to COVID-19. Yeah. Okay, so we have some of our preliminary results. Uh, this is just, um, this presenting results on percentage distribution of households on the basis of uh, the indicators of resilience capacities. But now we are presenting results on absorptive, absorptive capacity. We discover that at the end of the day, at the end of the analysis, majority of the households are actually low in their access to many of these items under uh, absorptive capacity. The ones that are relatively high, uh, well, uh, use of informal savings pool within the communities, which is high, more, more or less the same for the two groups. And also, yes, under informal safety net, we have uh, people, our household, who made use of, uh, who got money from different sources, okay? Some have one, some have up to two, okay? So we have this, for the two groups. Other informal safety nets, where we discover that for affected communities or affected households, we have 30%, 30.6% recorded for that, while uh, for unaffected households, uh, we did not have any representation in that uh, category of response. Then um, our analysis, result of analysis on adaptive capacity is also presented here. Uh, uh, access to financial institution, livelihood diversity, mm -hmm. and access to financial resources. These are indicators that we collected information about uh, on adaptive capacity. Like, just like the absorptive capacity, generally there is also a low level uh, of, uh, I mean, of adaptive capacity, given their responses to each of the items under this, uh, this, uh, Pillar. The highest level is That's secondary. Yeah. The highest, the variable, uh, highest level of certification. Which person is household head? It's household head. This data set is at level of, I mean, at the level of household. It's household head. I'm seeing you have included the adapt. Then you have the other capacity. So, 
those okay. are the same indicators for each each uh, each resilience pillar. For example, adaptive capacities mm -hmm. are standalone, eh? independent variable. You included in that model, the one that you presented. Exactly. You also do have another capacity, but then within capacity, for example, this one you have so like you know, financial institution, maybe a person got money through um financial institution, but then you have some, you know, money in the other capacity. So I was saying maybe no yeah. what. The, having access to financial institution is not necessarily the same as having support from maybe members of household or maybe a friend somewhere or maybe a, a sibling in another city somewhere. So this is different from uh, the other part. This is as defined by the, the framework that we are making. Let me ask, sure we can come back to that and maybe go back to the slides and so but what is affected and unaffected affected and unaffected conflict on affected COVID or conflict affected conflict, conflict unaffected uh, sorry uh on I'm I'm online the participant I had similar question so is your total respondent sample size split into the two types affected and non-affected yes um conflict affected yeah, and, yeah. and non perfect. It would it may be also good to just give basic uh, sample size of how what percentage of your sample or actual number of sample are in first column and in the second column, uh, just for uh, understanding oh, oh, on the prevalence oh, okay, okay. of affected and non affected. Thanks. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I think maybe in our result later we'll see we have an idea of the the number. Uh, I mean, for some of the results. We're not sure roughly what it yeah. is. Uh, I think for uh, affected is around seven hundred something, seven thousand. I mean seven hundred something, and for unaffected is around one thousand. I think two hundred something. We'll see it later. Okay. We'll see it in so this. Thirty region. forty percent affected, something like that. Thirty or forty percent of the people affected, something like that. Exactly. 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 So we have for transformative capacity, access to services. Uh, we have access to internet services, access to basic services. All of, I mean, uh, as the indicators that uh, the respondents are able to access uh, and own trade, trading, a trading business as well. Then we also looked at the distance to uh, some key services like major road, Nearest to population, I mean, distance to nearest population center, distance in kilograms to the nearest market and to the nearest border crossing, and also to capital of state of residence. And we have the results. And the farthest uh, location is uh, the nearest market, which averages about 326 kilometers for affected communities, I mean, households, and 295 for unaffected households. So if I can pick up a bit on, on Sumeni's question, right? I mean, she was going to issues of the different indicators, as I understand, that are in each of these different capacities. And so for those that are not familiar, that I include myself in this, with really the details of this resilience literature, right? There are a lot of factors that go in, into defining each capacity. Exactly. The definition of each of those factors is not necessarily clear. There are a lot of them. You can define them in different ways. Exactly. Right? So exactly. it can all be kind of a, a black box, right? Um, and then these a person, a skeptical person, you know, unable to to, to really um, kind of decide kind of how uh, um, legitimate the approach is, right? So I guess the basic question is, is all of the, I know that these general capacities you're talking about are well established in the literature. Mm -hmm. Are you following all of the different factors that, um, well, the factors that you have, have those been used by other app authors, tested by other authors? Exactly. There's the kind of independent uh, validity of each of these, um, uh, uh, resilience capacity has been tested and so forth. Just give us a, a sense for the depth of that literature and how critically the different capacities have been analyzed. Yes, I presented some authors that have made use of um, Tango model, just like other models. 
And of course, many of them that did study both in Asia and even Africa, African countries, made use of tango model. And what they did was to pick variables of interest, okay, that define each of the resilience pillars that they actually looked at. So we have had different authors, different scholars who have made use of the tango approach to use and what they did was to allow that approach to guide the selection of different indicators, not necessarily having it as much as, I mean, as, de as defined by Tango, but having it in a representative number, okay? And that has been uh, our experience with literature search. Okay. Let me understand, this is the nearest population center, over 20,000 is only 63, 64 kilometers. So this is the nearest mark, nearest mark is over 300 or 200 kilometers. How can, how can it be so different? There are no centers of 20,000 that have, have a market. That's a good question. You see that? Uh, okay. On the second line, you're they're only 63 kilometers from a, a, a city of distance in kilometer to the nearest 300 kilometers from the nearest market. And Steve's saying, well, there must be markets in a city of 20,000. So why? How can the the distance to market be so high when the distance to a, a population center is one fifth of that? <laughs> Astro distance and capital of state of residence. I'm guessing at the capital of state capital would have a market at least. So, oh, for sure. So that might be, I don't know, uh, 30 to 46. So it, it, you might have to check. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll check. Yeah, yeah some numbers. And then the, I'm sorry, but the basic, if I look at those numbers, basically I see the affected and unaffected look nearly identical. Very, very. I mean, the, the differences tend to look in general seem to be very, very small, which I guess is a, a good thing. You've got two similar, similar populations, populations that were similar prior to these shocks. Mm -hmm. And then they were either, some of them were affected by the violence. Is that right? Or COVID by the violence? By the violence. But is that your, do you agree with that? Basically, these two populations look almost identical. Exactly, exactly. Just, just, it's really similar to me. I think something that would really help with the comparison of the tables, which is basically G-test, uh, seeing if there are different groups of population. Yeah. Okay, you mean for each of the items? Yeah. Okay, because, because the items are actually co collected. Okay, for the distances. Right? Do you mean by for this time? Now, because each, I mean, the items under this, under the like, transformative capacity, the one to the left, they actually collected at nominal level one and zero dummy. And so, you can, still have you can still go ahead with T test. I think, I think to basically show that the, let's say, the treatment population of the control group doesn't have much differences in terms of observable characteristics. Well, what we did, which I'm going to present results about much later, is to have an index of each of these. And we have t-test, uh, trying to test the difference between affected and unaffected communities. Mm -hmm. But that's after we had gotten the score, the index, for each of the- So you pop all of this into the index estimate. Exactly. And exactly. The index exactly. And cost the unaffected and unaffected. Exactly. test the differences Yes, yes. Yes, um, this, um, the level of, uh, absorptive capacity. This is the box plot showing the affected, I mean, uh, uh, absorptive capacity level after, uh, I mean, I, I, it, when I was trying to talk, I mean, discuss, uh, outline the methodology that was used, I talked about the fact that each of these was presented. And so we have it as low as um, 19.95. For unaffected, and also as low as nineteen point seven two for affected communities, which is an indication that the level of rest, I mean uh, absorptive capacity for both groups is actually uh, low. 
Then uh, now same, I mean, similar situation for transformative capacity. The study reveals that uh, for transformative capacity, the, the average score for uh, the unaffected group was 24.19. And for the affected group, it was 23.85. With an insignificant key, obviously. And it's not, it's not significant. It's actually not significant. Um, for adaptive capacity, the result reviews that is uh, a bit higher than average score obtainable. Okay, um, we have it about 53.32 for unaffected. And for the affected group, we have about it is 4.72, uh, which is uh, about the highest of the three pillars that uh, we have considered in the study. And for the overall resilience capacity, it's uh, about 35.4 for the unaffected group. And for the affected group, it's about 35.52. And we have the T statistic here, which shows that um, affected and unaffected groups are not significantly different by their overall resilience capacity. This is our summary I mean, results for a prevalence of COVID-19 in conflict and affected and unaffected regions. And the result reveals that uh, for unaffected, the average was around 7,808 uh, cases. While for affected, we have it about we have about 11,551 uh, cases in uh, unaffected households. I mean communities. You know, you you, you acknowledge that uh, the prevalence rates, the official prevalence rates, are quite a large underestimate, likely of actual um, prevalence. In the in the phone surveys, were there any questions to try to get at the likelihood that an individual had actually suffered from from COVID? Any questions about symptoms that they'd suffered in the past month or or whatever? Was there any questions like that in the phone survey? No, there are no questions like that on on, on longitudinal food, um, phone survey. Basically, it was asking them questions around whether they lost employment whether they had access to support services, maybe in form of uh, social safety nets, whether they also had uh, access to, whether they, are, they were containment measures in their states and uh, maybe, yeah. and their full security for some of the rounds. Okay. But no, no symptom questions to get at. No, no, there were no symptoms. I think probably need to check, uh, check that, that part one more time. Um, I mean, I'm not sure, but I, I remember having some, not exactly like this COVID prevalence, but some questions related to that, but but you can, I mean, you, you will know. Uh, okay. Me. So you can just check if there are any questions. Because I think this COVID prevalence is at the state level, right? At state level, yes. Yeah. Very, so very at least. Probably. Yeah, so it's that's why the, the number of cases, but I think, the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, okay. This is my wish from. I was already, but, uh, so um, I maybe I missed uh, when you started presenting this table and data. But what's the time frame for your def defin defining affected? Yes, no, and prevalence of COVID-19? Because you introduce that you're using data from several rounds of LSMS ISA and then also phone surveys. Uh, so that means you must have either panel data or cross-sectional data of different time frames. So how, and then now in number of observations, you only show like two, around 2000 households. Are this, uh, are you just take, picking one of the latest survey round and defining these variables, or uh, maybe it's coming up in your following slides, but I just uh, am not very clear as of now, your time frame for defining this shock variables. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what we did was to make use of the last round of the 
LSMSIAC data to assess of their, 2019, so of 2019, 2019 okay. to assess their resilience capacity. And so at that level, I mean that there was no data available to be able to differentiate between affected and unaffected households uh, in terms of conflict. But in order for us to be able to uh, have the two categories clearly well defined in our data set, what we did was to link the ACLE data set with this LSMS IAC data. Uh, and that uh, made it very clear for us to be able to see communities, I mean, local government areas that are affected by conflict. We initially proposed to use the georeferenced information to be able to create a buffer around households that have experienced conflict so as to be able to use that to link the LSMS ISA data because the two of them are geocoded. But because we needed some uh, support in that regard with respect to how to do that on the software we are making use of, which is R, we needed to step that down. And so that's not part of this analysis. What we have done was to use the local government information of affected communities uh, and use that to determine those affected and those that are not affected. It is that that went into this. And it was based on that information that we got from ACLEG that we now match with our LSMS ISA data. And it was on the basis of that that we are able to and, uh, uh, and so you are you are taking just 2019 occurrence of conflicts. Yeah, when, not, 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 not just 2019. We started from 20 okay 2019 2020 data set. So yes. over the two year period, you if any of the geographic unit that you are uh, analyzing has was affected, you quote them as yes, affected. And if it was not affected over these 24 months or whatever the time frame of two years, then it's no not affected, correct? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So over a two year time frame, whether they were affected, even by one event, they would have been yes, affected, and zero would have been no. Yes, exactly. Of course, we have to settle for a dummy kind of approach because of the limitation in our approach, in our approach to merging the data. If we had uh, succeeded in using the, I mean, using the georeferenced information to link our LSMS data, it would have been sufficient to be able to capture more variables. For example, fatality, which is also in the, which is also available in the ACLE data, it would have been easy for us to merge it with uh, the LSMS IAC data. Well, we have to leave that, but we we are we are so going you back. Were to, able to make yes. a link between the ACLA geocoded and the LSMS. Geocoded? Exactly, but we are still going back to that. And by the time we are able to succeed in that, we are, we'll be able to have conflict uh, by prevalence, which will be indicated by frequency of occurrence and also fatalities. Mm -hmm number of fatalities. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is it is important to clarify that you are looking at the sort of a two year time frame of this occurrence. Uh, and that may have some implications on what you find. Like if one occurrence happened two years ago, would that still have an impact on, on, on my resilience today or outcome of whatever you're looking on the left-hand side? But right okay. now you're not looking at the temporal dimension, correct? You're just lumping all occurrences of conflicts in the last two years. Uh, exactly. Okay. exactly. 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 Yeah, but again, you're going to move when you get all this. You're going to be able to link them to, on the geo codes. You're exactly. Gonna, you'll be able to get these measures of maybe intensity of deaths, exactly. and frequency of experience exactly. over those two years. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about. Um, so people talk about their temporal issues, but even spatially, um, what is the unit analysis when you're talking about uh, the conflict area? What is because the uh, LSMS INSA uh, data is on the household level? Uh, what is the level analysis in the conflict area? How do you define? It? Okay, yeah, no, um, level. Of, I mean, unit of measurement, right? Unit of analysis. Well, uh, we were going to get to household level, but as a result of that limitation, which I which I just explained now, 
we could not get to household level. So it was captured really at local government level. So it is by affected local government, unaffected local government. But the local government is like the third administrative unit in Nigeria after state. So right now there are 776 local government. 74, 774. So right now it's merged at that level, but in further analysis, there would be personalized or customized buffer zones around the household location and calculate the number of incidents within that. Within that. Okay. That makes sense because I I use the elements I say data and for the purposes of like they they the jail codes are not exact they are uh, randomized around the buffer area actually so if it was like the household level then there would be some uncertainty defining households that were affected versus not affected it would exact mm -hmm. which Definition of the two groups. Yeah. No, normally in empirical papers, sometimes they use both in the sense like a predefined administrative area as well as a self-defined administrative area and check whether those results concur or not their oldest. So that could be. Okay. Okay, yes. Um, this table is showing the difference in security status of conflict affected and unaffected households across again, this is pre-shock this is pre-shock 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 pre pre-shock and aftershock pre-shock is with four and aftershock is round two round four and round seven okay so wait yeah. for the lsms I wait for the yeah, lsms so, so what we are trying to do is to test whether there is significant difference for each of those rounds okay Okay, for affected and unaffected households. Okay. And so we have um, the results showing that there's actually significant difference across the, I mean, the four periods in which the test was conducted. And it shows that also uh, unaffected households have significantly higher level of food insecurity because the scale we use is actually household uh, food insecurity assessment, assess scale, okay, which actually measured food insecurity. So the higher, higher the score, the higher the uh, food insecurity level. And so it shows that affected, unaffected households have higher level of food insecurity compared to uh, their affected counterparts. And that was the situation across the uh, rounds of the study. It also shows, also shows that for both affected and unaffected, there was a drop in food security level immediately after COVID. That's like two months into COVID. We have 4.94 for unaffected households and we have 4.66 for affected households. So it dropped from this point to this particular point. And of course, by round four, it started picking up for both groups as well. And at round seven, it also started uh, picking up, picking up, yeah. So by round seven, back about the level of pre- Not, 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 not at that level still yet. yet. Not at that level yet, but there was an improvement already. It started here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, which company? Hmm? Which one? Good access. Good access. So, no, other variables are not available post COVID. Other measures of food insecurity are available pre COVID, but for post COVID data available, it's only uh, this scale that we have made use of, and that's why we used um, this in the LSMS pre COVID, the last week has other measures of food security, but the longitudinal high frequency longitudinal phone survey does not contain other measures, it's only this measure that's available at that level of the 
So I didn't get that. So, so I mean, is, is this like the sample size, the side, the sample size of the mask RS survey, or just the size of the sample that we spawn to the from the No, the sample we're able to get because the LSMS provided was the sampling frame for the high high frequency phone survey. And so those individuals that were interviewed, not everybody, even in the last wave of the LSMS that was interviewed, not every household. So every household that were available at the, at, I mean, at post-COVID period, that you can, we can easily link with household available pre-COVID at what uh, we have represented here. So you're basically selecting samples from the LSMS. Exactly. But like exactly. is there any significant difference between the response rate you know, in terms of when you're conducting this because is that possible that in those like that conflict affect areas right farms that are responding that so that the samples you can collect from, from those areas are so actually the farmers that are less affected by the difference in terms in terms of the response rate. Well, across the waves, I mean the rounds of the phones of it, there was really no, no, I mean, there was no significant attrition from round one even to round two. Now, this is just the first round. Like, You're asking if uh, if uh, nearly 2,000 yeah. are a random, represented a random sample of a larger sample. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I think round. One around one around one, which is actually the first round of um, this round of uh, longitudinal phones of it was they were I mean the samples were randomly selected from the high frequency I mean from the LSMS IC data randomly selected. But but did everybody have a phone number <laughs> to randomly select? It has to that that assumes that everybody had a phone number. Well, I think everybody has a phone number. In LSMS ISA data set, I doubt. Everybody, everybody has a phone through which they can be, they, they could be reached. Every, 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 every individual has a phone through a contact through which they could be reached. I think it's fair to say that there are significant issues related to comparing the pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, so I think the post-COVID surveys are essentially telephone rounds compared to the in-person interviews. That's that's one thing. And second, I think as Mayvish correctly pointed out, I think the data for the post-COVID also depends on the response rates, whether they access the phones, whether they uh, ability to answer the questions. Yeah, I think those were important factors in deciding this. I need to like, do further tests to check the robustness of the result. Okay, yeah, check for systematic differences. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this um, this result, our first regression result, and at this level, what we did was to uh, control for time. I mean, it's a fixed effect regression controlling for time, state, and output. And of course, uh, what we did was to uh, do an interaction between COVID and conflict uh, without our resilience indicators uh, included in the model. And uh, I mean, the result reveals that COVID pre prevalence alone, okay, has a positive relationship with food insecurity, uh, meaning that the higher the prevalence rate at the level of um, State at state level, as it is, I mean, we collect our data, our prevalence data at state level. So the higher the prevalence rate, then the higher the level of food insecurity. But interestingly, we discovered that uh, uh, interaction of COVID and conflict actually gave rise to improved food insecurity. Improved I mean, food improved, improved food security. Uh, COVID nineteen interacting with conflict uh, led to an improved food security situation in, in the country.
And um, at this level, what we did here was to include the, I mean, the same state household and um, time fixed effect, uh, including now all the three resilience pillars into the model. And so uh, we, this result still remains uh, just like it was without inclusion of the resilience pillars. It's, it may, I mean, it reveals that COVID-19 prevalence led to as positive relationship with food insecurity. And also it reveals that uh, combined effect of COVID-19 and conflict led to improved food security situation. And in addition to that, it shows that uh, the adaptive capacity of, of the people, of the households and their transformative capacity uh, significantly improved their food security level. Sorry, when you look at the RSPAT, it's 0.288. Yeah, it's very low. <laughs> that means maybe most of the exponential variables included in the model exclude the changes. Uh, I don't know. Benjamin, okay. What? Yes, we ran it, we just deleted it. Is that? Yeah, it was significant. Yeah. So, how does that compare to R squared? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was. That's the Okay, maybe we'll have to check again. And I'm wondering how this compares to, to the, you, you get papers that have, you know, regressions with many significant variables and very low R squared, right? Um, you know, it's a legitimate question for sure, but I'm just wondering in other literature, how, how this compares to what you find in other literature. Okay, so what we're looking at here about the R squared and then my question about the R squared can increase if anyone if you add more variables you're gonna keep increasing the R squared. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's like a big problem. Um, a low R squared maybe I don't know but it's, yeah it's um would be a good idea to compare to other papers in the same way. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the multi-collinearity concern. Because uh, the indices, like the index for each one of them, they're loosely defined. So in the patient, does it, does it do you have concerns about them being uh, uh, correlated? Covenia. Yeah, Covenia. Well, I don't think um, there should be a concern around um, collinearity multipollinearity because we did factor analysis that uh, actually came uh, and eventually we came up with factors that are loaded differently, which means uh, the factors, the pillars that actually went into this were uh, contain items that are not, that are independent of each other. So I don't think for this analysis, we have issues with multipollinearity. So I don't remember exactly the last one that we all stopped to look at those tables with the distances. For example, in a lot of them you have access to internet and things like this. Well, and then have a look well, like well, those the tables I we presented earlier were results before the factor analysis. Yeah. The okay. tables on uh, transformative, adaptive, and absorptive were results of all items mm -hmm. on which we have data before we eventually did factor analysis. So the result of factor analysis is not presented, but it was the result that we used to compute an index for each of the uh, indicators before, I mean, that now went into this, into this model. Uh, I think you can also like, either prove or disprove a point by running them separately mm -hmm. and Checking whether this is a, the same or Oh, okay. Um, we run uh, okay the pillars separately. 
actually, that has been an area of concern as well from the feedback we got from Cornell. They are also looking at unbundling the so that we handle the indicators uh, oh, okay. individually. Okay. And, and exactly, in that wise, we hope uh, that we will be able to see the, the effect of the indicators so clearly on the, the so it is a level we hope to move to after. Yeah. So what we'll do is to now, I mean, not all the items that will now go into regression, but all the items will be subjected, irrespective of under which pillar, will be subjected to uh, factor analysis. So at the end of the day, we have limited number of factors that eventually will go into the uh, last uh, regression model that we, we may have to settle for. Uh, well, I, I think best thing to regard is that, uh, an ongoing one, literature uh, in terms of like once you use factor analysis or principal component analysis, the, the causality argument kind of disappears altogether. So that's um, that, that is one of the important feedbacks in these Cornell workshops too. Um, so further analysis and what are you really trying to achieve? So I think that's a very valid point in terms of you know how to interpret the Thank you. I just have a quick question. Okay. Sorry. So I'm looking at this coefficient of COVID, the interaction of COVID and conflict, and I'm just wondering how that number relates to food, to the dependent variable. Is that a big um, coefficient in magnitude, or is it? Relatively small, like just thinking in economic terms or practical terms. Is it meaningful? What, 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 yeah. what, well, it looks small because that's like 0. Um, 0. 0. 0.002, if I'm correct. Uh, but then it's significant that even um, 1%. But, yeah, I'll just say that it works, like just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, like one increase in uh, in combined effect of COVID-19, unit, one unit increase in combined effect of COVID-19 led to like 0 0.002, uh, like 2%, okay, I think 0 0.2% increase in food security. Uh, I think it may not be that low, given that the COVID-19 prevalence mean was like 11,000, uh, because it's measured at the state level, right? So you might have to look at it, because unit increase means it's- One out of 11,000. Yeah, so it could be different, the interpretation. Okay. In the sense, like, it's, because it's the interaction term, so it depends on the average. Yeah, right? so yeah. It might be really hard. So, is there a pattern concern? Independent of like the index between zero and one. The, which one? Of the dependent. Period. Period. Yeah. Uh, okay. The dependent variable is um one to eight. I think in time like one hundred something, so it makes it like between the margin. Oh. Positions. Okay. So make it one to hundred, right? That doesn't actually change too much, but like in your table, it will be like going a lot more than instead of more than Okay. So it's easier to like explain this out in terms of the specific numbers. Okay. All what right. what what is your did you use OLS or what type of model did you use to estimate this? Yeah, fixed uh, effects regression, panel uh, regression. Okay, so uh, your dependent variable is basically a count variable, no? It's a count of number of. So there are eight questions that are asked uh, exactly. in this FIES indicator, and it's basically a count of how many of those eight are yes, and that's the score, correct? Yes. So it where it can be from uh, zero to eight. Yes, uh, it is. Um, 
yeah. so you may want to think of uh, some other i mean the <laughs> ways of uh, estimating uh, the model when your dependent variable is a count variable uh, you know it sounds like a continuous variable it, but it it is basically a count variable z1 0 to 8 uh, mm. so you know just think about that and then the other question i had was the um, I still have this issue with the way you are defining your conflict uh, variable. It seems like you're not utilizing the, the richness of your panel data. You have uh, four rounds. Uh, you're basically making your conflict variable a static variable uh, by, by using last two years, any occurrence of conflict, which means there is no variability or variation in that conflict uh, dummy variable uh, across your four rounds of data, correct? So all, uh, all households across the four round will either have a zero, no conflict, or one, yes, conflict. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, so yes. overall. Three That's right. So basically, it's like you are not utilizing it. And, and then in the case of your COVID-19, is that yes or no or is that some other variable yeah for COVID-19 is measured uh with prevalence and also right, but what do you mean by prevalence is it number of cases number of deaths number of number of cases number of cases or percent of percent number number and so so it's number of cases in a given, given oh. LGA or state or what level it, it presently is at state level, but we are okay. we have requested uh, data at local government level. We are expecting uh, uh, that as soon as we get back. But then we, for this, for the purpose of this analysis, we have gone ahead with the state level data, which is uh, open access. Well, certainly, as, as okay. you said, it should be number per hundred thousand population or whatever. It has to okay, be standard. It should be okay. number. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you would have like zero for your whatever the last 2019 20 LSMS data point, you would have zero cases, correct? And then some positive fluctuating numbers for the other three rounds. It must have, it must be just going up an increasing number for the other three rounds, correct? Is it cumulative or what? what is that prevalence? Okay. Cumulative or in the last week or month or? No, it's cumulative, it's cumulative. Yeah, which means it's just an increasing number over time. Exactly. Over the four rounds. Over the so four you, rounds. Yeah, so you have like your, your two main shock variables. One is an increasing number, it starts with zero and then increases. Uh, with your first phone survey round up to the, the last phone survey round. And then you have this other shock variable, which is a constant. It is either one or zero for all four periods. And I, I just um, would like you to think about how would you maybe make that shock variable um, a little more <laughs> variable over time uh, to, to, to get at the impact of that. Because right now it's, I just have a little difficulty <laughs> uh, wrapping my head around this conflict uh, way you have defined your conflict shock um, and see how, what added value does it bring in terms of your understanding the effect of that when it's just a constant over the four time periods. I wish, can I also comment? I think if it's constant, you cannot do how to fix the effect. That is also, a problem, right? So the conflict must change over time in your model, right? Otherwise, you cannot use a house of fixed effect. Yeah, they're doing state fixed effect, correct? Or is it at house of and the state? I saw. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. So that that is my issue as to it's if it is a panel data, you need some variability. Right. So is it zero one for each round, or is it zero one for the three rounds for a given household? No, it's different for the for the, for the, for the whole, all three rounds. rounds. Yes, yes. 
but okay but what you're going to move to, but that you're doing that because you don't you haven't been able to link up with the ACLED data yet right no the, the data we have is 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 not according to years it's just available at the end of the rounds so we took the data that is available as at the last round that's the data you're using now yes that's what about the ACLED data the ACLED data is as um, data available for fatality, which is number of... Um, and is it again at one point in time at the end? Or, or do you have that over time that you can link it, it to the no, round? We have it over time. We have it over... I mean, it's, it's dated. All the cases are dated. So we we'll have it over time. Yeah, okay. My understanding is that ACLED data are by geo-coded and by time-coded. It will also tell you when those events occur. Yeah, that's what he was just saying. Uh, yeah. He said it's time-coded. The, yeah. the question is, like, all the conflict variable is time variant. Uh, COVID variable is not. In the sense, like, if you use, let's say, the first four rounds, the COVID measurement is not varying across time. So, basically, you would be treating each round as a cross-sectional unit in terms of the COVID measurement, COVID shock measurement. Because for all four rounds, it will be zero. Mm -hmm. And how Thanks. about the index, like transformative and uh, absorptive and adaptive? From the beginning, you describe it is based on the last round of survey. So this value should also just constant, right? Or are they varying? Are, are they what, uh, something? No, for these three indices, indices right? The adaptive, transformative, absorptive. So uh, earlier when I listened to the talk, uh, 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 the speaker mentioned this is based on the last wave of the data before COVID. So this variable should also be just constant number, or are they also varying? No, they're, they're, they're constant, constant, right? Yeah. You're transformative. So they're, they're fixed in 2019 and yeah. then they're constant. Through yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so that's why it makes me really wondering is this model specification a fixed effect? What does that really mean? I mean, uh, probably did something wrong, right? Okay. Okay, we'll check. And, and, and I'm sorry, but I guess the other thing that's missing here because you haven't put it all together yet, um, given that we know there was lots of underreporting on COVID prevalence. We don't know if that underreporting was consistent across states, right? Some states may have reported better than other states. So it's hard to know what to make of the COVID prevalence data. Right? The real shock from COVID is in, in two shocks. In an individual getting seriously ill from COVID or dying in the family, that's one shock, but if you don't have that, the other shock is the policy shock, right? Um, you know, shutdowns, was your neighborhood subject to a shutdown or this type of thing? So um, if we look forward, we're already at five o'clock here, but what I understand is you're going to link in this OCLED data. You're going to get measures of intensity of, of okay. conflict exposure, but also you'll get time varying estimates of that. That would address my wishes if you can use the time stamp, if you will, the time coding on those to get time varying uh, measures of conflict to intensity, right? So two dimensions of improvement there. And then you'll build in some measures of the policy responses yes. and you'll be estimating the yes. effects of that. And so in the end, will your, will your because the, the sign on the, on the interaction term makes no sense, of course, right? Right, it's improving food security, which I don't think we think makes sense. But will you be interacting COVID prevalence with conflict, or will you be interacting some of these COVID policy shocks with conflict? But uh, the one um, one possible um, explanation for that is like um, in in areas that are already affected by shocks, that is like um, since this case conflict, right? Because conflict is it actually precedes COVID in terms of occurrence in many of those places. So. There could be a significant uh, exponential shock based on um, development assistance programs on or for me because one of the reasons, I mean, one of the 
things that literally just suggest is like there is no um, consistent or constant uh, distribution programs in place nationally. Where, while they respond some, to events. Yeah. And so, if because of that reactiveness in some of those places, which are already exposed to conflict, there might be more, um, a few more like uh, um, structures in place or systems in place. Uh, because if you look at the development assistance data, I think conflict affected areas um, actually uh, receive a lot of money compared to non conflict uh, areas. And also, I think it's one of the major policy and political right. debates in Nigeria, which is all the money is actually going to the <laughs> conflict zones, yeah. which is one of the, I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, be, but conceptually, shouldn't all of that investment be captured in the transformative uh, capacity? Because that looked to me like all community level kinds of things, uh, safety and so forth. Sure, yeah, but yeah. I think uh, one of the points that they raised were like, um, some of the more informal um, safety, safety nets, nets. Uh, uh, yeah. things related to that are not actually captured. It could, it could, it could. I'm just. Yeah, okay. That makes it an interpretation of that. Yeah, it could. Do, it could okay, you want to say something? And actually, the transformative capacity uh, was more of the infrastructural provisions from the governments to. <clears throat> That uh, the household could leverage on in order to bounce back mm -hmm. after the shock. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the provision of uh, support and aid, such as uh, a, 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 some formal or informal aids coming, uh, it is not actually under transformative that that absorbs. But the real experience in Nigeria was that uh, there was more attention to the northern areas where we have more of the country. Mm -hmm. And actually, when like there is a kind of a program cash transfer in order to give some kind of support to the less privileged and the poor, so it was skewed towards the north, particularly because it is believed that uh, they are already facing insecurity in shows. So the assumption is that uh, they are more vulnerable and they must be given more support, mm -hmm. forgetting that even those that are not exposed to shock also have several challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, they are insecurity. So, the result actually looked somehow strange, but by the time we began to think in between the lines, we realized that there, there are so, so, some supports that went more to the side of those that are conflict affected. Those that are conflict affected did not have a privilege to. So we hope to explore it further and then see how this actually comes clearer as we do for the analysis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And actually, the next analysis will be quite different because you'll have a much richer ACLED news, shock, okay. conflict shock data, and you'll have the uh, COVID containment measures. Yeah. 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 Another, uh, another thing, although which was not captured on our data, is we are also looking at, okay, um, shortly after COVID lockdown was an announced, okay, and because the areas most affected by conflict, uh, the areas where you have the bulk of the food that is consumed in Nigeria is produced. So when lockdown work measure was announced, obviously it reduced the rate at which food Hello. got their yeah, flow. And so it lead, led to uh, a skyrocketing, I mean, in, in, yeah, in, in the south, right. and that made it easy. I mean, difficult for people down south areas that are not very affected by conflict mm -hmm. to have less mm -hmm. uh, access mm -hmm. to food, mm -hmm. and possibly uh, those in the northern part of the country who are affected have more right. to access. So right. those were the uh, and, and just like you said, uh, maybe at the end of the day, our, our final. Regression analysis will throw more light into some of these uh, theories around 
Oh, I already saw them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think this, um, Benjamin will come now to come and finish up. Just so. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. And uh, I want to actually appreciate inputs that have been coming in all the way. So because we are way uh, behind time now, I'll just rush up the rest because we are close to just our conclusion. We realized that uh, resilience capacity was low, both for the conflict affected and uh, conflict unaffected household from, from the, the right from the baseline level of the study. And uh, we also realized that um, without the moderation effect of wrestling capacity conflict, uh, the COVID-19 and the uh, armed conflict uh, shocks are the uh, positive, that is meant to be positive, the sorry that, yes, they had positive effect on food security. And also after resilience pillar was even introduced, the, 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 the relationship still remained positive. Sorry, that place should be positive. So we realize also as already presented that adaptive and transformative, transformative capacities help household build resilience to COVID-19 more than the absorptive capacity. And the household uh, have low resilience capacities in, irrespective of whether they were conflict affected or otherwise that has been mentioned. Then economic effect of conflicts uh, is not only limited to community within proximate distance, but also those with th those with whom they share common economic uh, relationship. So we realize that the effect of conflict uh, actually affected those that are under the conflict area as well as those that are close by to them because of the flow of food and also some other ripple effects. And uh, there was low resilience capacity which is lowest with the absorptive capacity as earlier mentioned. Now to the policy relevance. This study actually will be hinging more on the social protection uh, program in Nigeria. And uh, we see that uh, the output from the study will throw more light into what is actually happening in the national uh, social register because it is realized that because of conflicts, there have been more attention to where the conflict was. Whereas the attention is being shifted from the fact that there are those areas not affected by conflict, but still are having issues with food security. So it should be more inclusive. That is the recommendation that could be generated. And um, after COVID-19, we, we discovered that the National Social Register uh, has not been so much visited as expected, such that it, had, it needed to be improved, refreshed, so that uh, as people uh, fall below the poverty line and also rise above, there should be a way to capture the appropriate uh, uh, intended beneficiary of the social protection in the country. And then, um, okay, that shows. And then the targeting mechanism, this study also will have to uh, give recommendations that will assist on the tag targeting mechanism. And um, we hope to use resilience uh, and uh, in that way, look at shocks, look at some other factors that can help further future recommendations that will improve on several interventions that can come into the country generally. Thank you so much for your attention.